the information from a lot of, a lot of different sources, including um, the higher ed aspect of it, my personal experience with it, and then also um, the experience I have from being a CASA and with the Youth Policy Institute. So the key takeaways that I want you to have today is the history of foster care in the US, just a brief history overview of that, the educational outcomes of foster youth, the barriers to education, and how we can support students who do have experience in foster care. Also, if you could please remember to keep the chat in the Zoom session and not the WOBA app, that would be great. All right, I have a couple disclaimers before we get started here. The presentation and some of the content is gonna discuss the harsh treatment experienced by children of color in the United States. And so I just wanna acknowledge that it could be emotionally disturbing to some people. It could stir up some memories or just um, bad feelings. So if you need to mute or step away from the computer at any time, that is perfectly acceptable. I also want to give a disclaimer on the challenges of data in the foster care system. So different agencies use different verbiage to describe races and ethnicities. For the purposes of today's presentation, Black and African American will be used synonymously, as well as American Indian and Native Alaskan, as well as Hispanic and Latino, and Asian and Native Hawaiian. Because there is no federal foster care system, it's all divided up between the states. Um, they don't always use the same terms exactly. And so sometimes the data doesn't align um, perfectly, but we do our best to still get the results across that the studies are trying to show. Also, each state defines foster care differently, as well as individual studies. So foster youth can mean a lot of different things. For example, it could mean that they aged out of their foster care system at age 18, or some states, they have extended foster care to age 21. It could also be that the child has spent any amount of time in foster care at any age. So maybe they were in foster care at age 10, but they weren't at age 18, but they were still included in the study. There could also be kinship care. So kinship care is when a child is removed from their home. However, they get to go live with relatives or close family friends instead of a foster home, which is generally strangers to the child. Uh, grandparents are kinship care. A lot of the times so they fulfill that role. So the first bit of information I want to show you is the current landscape of the U.S. foster care systems. So some racial and ethnic groups are underrepresented. For example, the Hispanic and Latino identity group, you can see the red bar there for the national foster care system. And then the blue bar there is for the general population. The gray bar is Iowa foster care and the yellow is the Iowa general population. And so looking at the chart, we can see that the general population bars are higher, which means they are underrepresented in the foster care system at both the national and state levels. Now, there are some states, I believe last time I looked, it was six states where the Hispanic and Latino identity is overrepresented, but in the majority of states and averaged nationally, they are underrepresented. The next group is the Asian and Native Hawaiian population. They are definitely underrepresented in the foster care industry. In fact, they are the least likely to be entered into foster care of all ethnic groups. And then lastly, we have the white population, which makes up 50% of our general population and about 76% of the Iowa population. And so they are underrepresented because their foster care percentages do not match. So naturally, if there's underrepresented groups, there are going to be overrepresented groups. Here, the bars are reversed. 
we can see that the American Indian Native Alaskan group has higher bars in both the national foster care versus the general population bars and the Iowa foster care versus the Iowa population bars. At least in the foster care industry, we don't have very good data on what it means when you select two or more races as the children go into this system. And so we can't talk too much about what this means other than we just know that if you are more than one race, you are overrepresented. And lastly, the Black and African American group is clearly overrepresented in the national and Iowa foster care systems. The most likely group to go into foster care is the American Indian and Native Alaskan. They have about 13 of every 1,000 children into the system. So we're gonna talk very briefly about the early origins of foster care. So how did we get to where we were today? So it goes back into some of the earliest documentations that we have. <laughs> it goes all the way back to the Old Testament, the Talmud and early Christian church records. So we've been taking care of other people's children for a very long time. Um, in the early Christian church records, they would even refer to the children, the, the adults that the children were boarded with were called worthy widows. It was the English poor law, however, that led to the development and the eventual regulation of family foster care in the United States. In 1562, these laws allowed the placement of poor children into indentured service until they became of age, which today is 18. This practice was imported to the United States and was the beginning of placing children into homes. In 1636, less than 30 years after the Jamestown colony was founded, Benjamin Eaton became the nation's first foster child and he was only seven years old. And then in 1853, Charles Long Brace, he began the free foster home movement. He was a minister and director of the New York Children's Aid Society. He was concerned about the large number of immigrant children sleeping in the streets of New York. So he devised a plan to provide them homes by advertising to the South and to the West. And they essentially put them on a train, they're known as the orphan trains, and they relocated them to other parts of the country. In many cases, these children were placed in circumstances similar to indentured servants. They were expected to work for the family in exchange for housing, basically. However, that is not what it's supposed to be today, but braces, um, plan, it did become the foundation for the foster care movement as it exists today. In 1909, this was the first time that our federal government recognized the foster care systems happening in the states, and President Roosevelt gave the first White House conference on foster children. So now we're going to talk specifically about the Black and Native American history of foster care in the United States. While slavery was not in any way meant to resemble foster care, we also cannot ignore the similarities. Slavery and foster care can elicit similar feelings as they both involve the government forcibly taking and separating black children from their mothers and their families. Some scholars and researchers acknowledge this because of the similarities, whereas other people, they do not associate them together whatsoever. In terms of modern day foster care, uh, the treatment of Black and African American children has been marked by racism, manifested in inequitable policies and inadequate services. The first orphanage, as they were called back then, officially opened in 1729, but children of color were not included. Following the Civil War in 1968 and emancipation, creation of the Freedmen's Borough was to facilitate the reunification and families separated by slavery. However, many people suggest that there were no actual reunifications or promises to strengthen the family life for the child. Instead, the Freedmen, Freedmen's Bureau, it basically became a labor agency redirecting Black youth to the indentured servants to former slave owners. 
In fact, Mississippi went as far as to give the child's former slave master priority in acquiring his labor, effectively reestablishing the master and slave relationship. After reconstruction, repression and economic pressure ensured that black children remained a source of cheap labor. There were a few cases where a black child was allowed into foster care, um, such as Malcolm X. However, the real transformation of foster care into a system predominantly populated by black children started in the 1930s. Uh, this is when the Federal Aid to Families with Dependent Children program was created uh, to help low-income single mothers provide for their children. Louisiana and other states created rules of eligibility, a concept that was explicitly based on white middle-class ideas of morality and character that said unmarried women were unfit and therefore funds would be cut off to those women. Then President Kennedy's Secretary of Health, Education and Welfare ruled that states could only withhold funds if the parents were found unfit. So they would find the mothers unfit because they're not married and then they would have to remove them from the home because they were determined to be unfit. During the 1940s and 50s, children of color were removed from their families at a rate three times as high as their proportion in the general population. In the 1960s, Louisiana cut off 23,000 children from aid over the course of just three months. 95% of those 23,000 children were black and or African-American. Since 23,000 children being removed from their homes at once would have been a huge financial strain on the government, Congress responded by allowing those aid funds to be used to offset the cost. So now, instead of giving the federal funds to the single Black mothers, the government opted to spend those funds to remove the children from the home instead. The real purpose of the policies was not to improve child well-being, but to remove families from the cash assistance programs. Many families did not even apply for these funds because they realized their children would be taken away if they did. So now that they knew that they couldn't apply for these funds anymore, the government had to think of a new way to remove children. So in 1974, our government passed the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act. So it funded services to prevent and address child maltreatment and required states to set up reporting and investigation systems. So essentially what they did, they're removing children from their homes for being poor. And when the parents and or children reacted in a negative way, the caseworkers would use that as validation that this is an unfit home and the parents or children, they need treatment or rehab. There's a lot of literature out there that looks towards the AIDS and crack cocaine epidemics as principal causes of the increase in foster care caseloads during 1985 to about the 2000 area. However, upon closer research, they found that the most important reasons for those increases though, it was actually due to female incarceration and decrease in welfare benefits that our government passed. Now, the reason why the mothers were incarcerated, it wasn't completely due to substance abuse. It was also due to mental illness, lack of accessible services, sexual and physical abuse, and then also prior incarceration. The black population is subjected to more harsh sentencing, so they are in prison longer, thus increasing the time spent in prison. Community characteristics also contributed, such as violence and homelessness. This led to the deterioration of conditions for children before the parents were incarcerated and thus increased the need for foster care. In 1992, for example, there was a disproportionate number of African-American children in Minnesota. So they only made up 3% of the population. However, they made up 19% of the number of kids in foster care. In 1997, President Clinton passed the Adoption and Safe Family Act. It prioritizes adoption and permanency over child reunification with their biological families. It instituted time limits, so the government can legally terminate biological parents' rights and force a child to be adopted by a different family, most likely a white family. 
Hence, the government is trying to make sure Black children are not returned to their families. If you remember the Child Abuse and Prevention Treatment Act of 1974, they would force the parents to go into treatment. Well, treatment takes a while. You know, there's a wait list to get in, plus the actual program takes a while. And now with the Adoption and Safe Family Acts of 1997, they're putting a time limit on it. So the parents can't even complete treatment in time before the courts terminate their rights and force them to be adopted by a different family. The system is most aggressive in taking action against Black single mothers. Child welfare involvement presents a clear example of the intersectionality of race and gender oppression. So we're gonna switch over now to the American Indian Alaska Native history of foster care in the United States. So the Native American assimilation era first began in 1819 when the US Congress passed the Civilization Fund Act. The passing of this act eventually led to the creation of federally funded Native American boarding schools and initiated the beginning of the Indian boarding school era. The duration of this era ran from 1860 until about 1978. Approximately 357 boarding schools operated across 30 states and both on and off reservations, and they housed over 60,000 Native children. Several forms of resistance were performed in response to having their children pulled out of their homes and forced to attend these schools. Sometimes entire villages refusing to enroll their children in the boarding schools, they would coordinate mass withdrawals as well as encouraging their children to run away from the schools. Indian agents, as they were called, these were individuals hired to interact with the native communities on behalf of the US government, they would retaliate by withholding food and supplies to their communities. These agents were also responsible for taking children from their families and their homes until the boarding schools were filled to capacity. In 1958, the Indian boarding schools, they were starting to wane a little bit. So the Bureau of Indian Affairs created the Indian Adoption Project. When the Bureau of Indian Affairs started the project, it enlisted social workers to visit the reservations and convince the parents to sign away their rights in a way to assimilate these children into civilization, they said. The government believed adoption was the best option for dealing with the perennial Indian problem, as they called it. By 1960, one in four Native children were living apart from their family. In 1978, the Native people fought for the Indian Child Welfare Act. It's called ICWA, it's more commonly referred as. And this gives tribes and Native parents the right to intervene in child welfare cases involving Indian children. It also gives the Native Americans priority in adoption. Because white people were removing Indian children simply because they thought white culture was better, ICWA mandates and enforce that a Native American be removed from their home, that they must be placed with a Native American family, friends, or foster parents before being placed in a white home for foster care or adoption. However, in a recent case, the U.S. Supreme Court has began to roll back ICWA. They held that a non-custodial Cherokee father could not prevent his daughter from being adopted by a white couple. The court said that some children might lose the benefit of being adopted by a white couple if ICWA was not weakened. This builds on a long genocidal history of removal and placement in Indian boarding schools on the assumption that it was necessary to separate the children from their families and communities in order to integrate them into a white civilization. And then the same thing with that Adoption and Safe Family Act that President Clinton passed in 1997. It puts time limits on how long a child can be in foster care before they are forced to be adopted. And so they just cut them off when the time limit is up and then they're free to be adopted. And if there's no Native American foster families available, then they can be adopted into a white family quicker. Well, that's a lot of history that we covered. So obviously I didn't cover everything because there's so much of it. Um, but if you're interested in learning more about it, I highly recommend this book, Taking Children, A History of American Terror by Laura Briggs. It talks about a lot of different circumstances where the government has been taking kids away from various populations for a very long time. Okay, so we looked at the history of foster care. 
and the current landscape of what the populations of kids in care are. Let's now look at the education part of it. So how is their education faring after they are entered into the foster care system? So this is one of my favorite studies that has been done. It's called the Midwest Evaluation of Former Foster Youth. It was conducted on over 700 youth from Iowa, Wisconsin, and Illinois. Its purpose was to provide the states with the first comprehensive review of how foster youth are faring as they transition into adulthood. The longitudinal study, the first wave in interviews started in 2002 when they were about 17 or 18 years old. And so after that, every two years, they would interview the same students, children who are now transitioning into adults. And they would ask them the same questions and see how they were doing. So they were about 26 years old in that final fifth wave. In that final fifth wave, the racial makeup of the respondents, 55% of them were black or African-American. So the results from this study are heavily tilted for that population. The Native American population was less than 1% in this study, but we know that their population is lower in the general population overall. And then as you can see, uh, white students made up 30% and Hispanic and Latino made up about three or 4%. So what did they find? What they found was 20%, so an entire fifth of the participants, they never finished high school and they never received a GED. 31 of them completed high school, but then did not continue on their education, so about a third, and 9% of them opted to get their GED instead. Now about another third of them, 32%, they enrolled in college, they went to college for at least a year, but they never obtained a college credential. So when you add all of these together, that comes up to 92% of the foster youth never obtained a college credential. So, you know, we can do the math. <laughs> so how many did get it? Of course, that's gonna be around 8% went on. And it's also worthy to note the two-year degree has the highest percentage of 4%. The four-year degree was less at three, and then one or more years of grad school was 1%. So how does this play against the general population? So I took the Midwest study and then I paired it up with the general population. I took the US census numbers. So the general population, they also had numbers for the black general population. However, they did not have data for the Native American, Alaska Native um, population. So that's why that's not on here. But if we look at the red line, which represents the foster youth in the Midwest study, we can see that they're achieving higher than the other groups when they're maxing out at no high school or GED or maxing out at high school or GED. Now those aren't races we really wanna be winning because that means we're maxing out early. We don't want that to be their peak. And then you can see after high school, the red line, it inverses, right? It now becomes the lowest achievement. You know, hardly any of these students are getting the two-year degree, the four-year degree and the graduate degree. Meanwhile, the general population, they are achieving those degrees at a higher level. So the foster youth are clearly not achieving college degrees at the rate of the general population. Okay, so what about Iowa? Like sure, Iowa was included in that Midwest study, but do we have any data there? And we do. So if we look specifically at this, we are great at graduating from high school and or getting their GED. You know, nationally about 69% of foster youth achieve that. The Midwest study, 72% of them had. And in Iowa, we're up to 78%. So yeah, we do a really good job for that. But what about the college credentials? Is it the same? Are we doing great? We are not. Uh, national studies, it really varies. It, it, it's anywhere from like 1% to 12%. Um, I, I used seven from the study I was looking at to complete this. And then that Midwest study told us 8% of them completed college. And then you look at Iowa and our data, it's only 4%. And I would like to say about that 4%, they're also including just credentials. So like a certificate, not even a college degree. So that 4% very well could be an inflated number. 
I went back, uh, this data is from 2021. So I went back and I looked at 2019 and 2017 and the completion rate for college in Iowa for those two years was 1%. So no, we're not doing very good. So thinking back to the Midwest study, there was that 32% of students who you know, graduated high school or got their GED and they actually went on to college. They enrolled and they attended. So what happened there? Why did this 32% in the Midwest study and then only 8% of them ended up graduating from college? Well, I do not have the data from the Midwest study, but I do have data from Iowa. So Iowa College Aid, it's our state representative that distributes our ETV grant. That's our educational training voucher. And this is a grant for foster youth who were either adopted after age 16 out of foster care or they aged out at age 18. So Iowa College Aid distributes scholarships to these students to help pay for their tuition. And so they gave me some really helpful data to share with you. So we can see in that first year, so the years are at the bottom there. They started in the 2012, 2013 school year and it goes forward from there. So we can see that we have about between 150 and you know, 225 students enrolling in that first year. And so, and this was over several years. And so, okay, so that's how many started, but then what happens? By their second year, enrollment just plummets about 50%. They don't make it to that second year. And so that's a, that's a huge dip. It's a huge problem. Obviously something's not working. And then you can see to the third year, it plummets about 50% of who was left and then about 50% the next year. I mean, that's the general trend. Every semester, it just gets lower and lower and lower. Now, sure, we can assume that some students graduated after two years if they went to a two-year school, and then maybe some after four years, and maybe some graduated after five. Right, there were some, but we know with the graduation rate of one to 4% in Iowa, that's not happening very often. Um, these students just, they're not making it. Iowa State does not track foster youth and their success rates. But national studies have shown that while foster youth attend two-year schools more frequently, they are actually retained better at four-year colleges and universities. There is a study in California that looked at this same thing. And so this is a very recent study and the percentage of all students who are no longer enrolled after that first year, you know, they, had a, they, they do track their foster youth in California. They're very proactive. And yeah, they're tied for second to last place. 45% of the foster youth in California didn't make it past their first year either. So Iowa isn't necessarily an outlier in poor persistence in higher education. We just need to be doing better nationally and working on it as a state at the same time. So what's leading to all of these foster youth not making it I mean, to graduation, but let alone to their second year. So let's look at some of those factors. First of all, lack of academic preparedness. When a child goes into foster care, a lot of times they have to change what school they're going to. There's no foster homes available in their school district. And so they go to the first foster home and sometimes it doesn't work out. So then they have to move to another foster home. Sometimes they have to move to a shelter. For example, here in Ames, we have the Rosedale shelter. Down in Des Moines, we have the Youth Emergency Shelter. Um, it now is owned by, is it Mid-American Homes? And they're rebranded as Ellipsis now, but there's a big one in Des Moines as well. And then sometimes they're hospitalized and then they go to a facility and then they go to another shelter and then they get another foster home. So they're constantly moving. And every time they move, it's likely that they're starting a new school. So you can imagine the negative effects of school mobility on academic achievement, they include lower scores on standardized tests, a greater risk of dropping out, and lower graduation outcomes. In fact, one study saw that youth with even one fewer change in living arrangement per year, they were almost twice as likely to graduate from high school before leaving foster care. 
So it does make a difference. Also, if they're constantly changing schools, they're gonna have trouble developing and sustaining supportive relationships with teachers or their friends. So this also leads to school enrollment delays. Every single time a kid moves, you have to get them re-enrolled. That takes time. I know kids who have been out of school for a month simply just because they switched schools and that's how long it took the school to get them enrolled. It's not a good situation. And so if this enrollment delay is happening every time they move, I mean, they're hardly ever in school then, right? So sometimes they have to repeat courses that they've already taken. Sometimes they're put in the wrong courses because they're all confused with the school records. They're incomplete. Some schools don't pass them along. And it's really hard to get a 504 plan or an IEP set up when you're constantly changing schools. It takes months to get it set up. So if you're constantly school hopping, it's not going to get done. And so then, of course, there's the attendance issues. So we're, we're already missing all the school because we keep changing schools. But then kids who are in care, they also have a lot of appointments they have to go to. Sometimes they have a lot of medical appointments. They have family visits that are mandated by the courts. They have court hearings to go to. Their DHS worker has to come visit them at least once every month. And kids in foster care also have a higher number of school suspensions. The suspension rate is higher for Black and African-American children, as well as the multiple placements. For example, in Iowa, 55% of the Black and African-American youth had three or more placements. So 55% of the Black and African-American youth in foster care had three or more placements during their time in foster care. Also, untreated trauma. It's kind of hard to get diagnosed with things when you're bouncing around all the time. <laughs> and so if you're not getting your trauma diagnosed, you have ADHD, autism, if those aren't getting diagnosed, that makes school so much harder. And then of course, group care. Group care is not a good situation to be in. There's a lot of behavioral issues that happen when they're there. And these schools, they're on site of the facility. They're not rigorous. They're, they're not meant to prepare students for college. Another big issue with factors leading to college incompletion is financial issues. So foster youth rely heavily on the Pell Grant. Um, and so when they don't meet satisfactory academic progress, they get dropped from their Pell Grant. And that's a really big issue. There's a lot of reasons why students aren't meeting SAP. And that goes into everything that we just talked about on that last slide, right? Like they are poorly prepared uh, to perform academically at the college level. And so they don't make SAP. So then they get dropped from their Pell Grant. They get dropped from all federal financial aid. And then, yeah, if you look here, they're in last place of all the groups that this study looked at. 34% of foster youth didn't make SAP after the first two consecutive terms. So that obviously has a huge detrimental effect to them being able to stay enrolled in college. Some other issues, they have no family support, right? Whether it's their biological family, whether it's one of the foster families they lived with, that's not there. They don't have anyone to call. They, don't, they need a pep talk and they don't have anyone to call to give them that pep talk. They do well on an exam. They don't have anyone to call. Everyone's getting care packages during prep week, but they're not, and they notice that. They also identified racial and ethnic stereotyping on campus as a reason why they didn't feel they fit in. Housing concerns. So if they're going to pay tuition, and they're going to pay for their housing and their meal plan, but they're going to be homeless over winter break and summer break, that doesn't really seem like a good deal to them. And so it discourages them from even enrolling in the first place. Pregnancy and child care, 70% of females who age out of foster care are pregnant by age 21. So seven out of 10 of them are going to have a baby. And so if they're enrolling in college, obviously child care becomes a huge issue. And then transportation, how are they even gonna get to college? Think about the rural areas in Iowa. Um, to get to your nearest public four-year institution, I mean, that could be hours away. I know mine is, I'm a couple hours away from Ames. And so I would have no way of gotten there if I didn't have someone to give me a ride. So how can you help these students? 
So campus supports like coaching, mentoring services, research stresses the importance of taking a holistic approach to ensuring that these youth have the support and stability to be academically prepared for post-secondary education. The financial assistance that they need for tuition fees, room boarding, but then also the ability to meet their basic human needs. And so what I did on campus last semester, we piloted a program called Stories, Students on the Rise in Educational Success. And this is for any student across the university who has experience in foster care or homelessness. They can join this program and we are trying to support them in a number of ways. Um, for example, students report that having a peer group with similar experiences, you know, they just get it. They don't have to explain themselves. That is super important to them. Studies show that students who were in a campus support program, those foster youth were twice as likely to persist in college than those who did not. Foster youth in another study said that they managed stress encountered in college by seeking counseling and increasing their involvement with the campus community. They report not having their basic needs met and so that affected their educational goal setting. You know, if you're hungry and you can't eat, you're not gonna be able to focus on studying for that exam coming up. In one study, 30 former foster youth um, were interviewed about the benefits of campus resources programs. And they said that one of the best parts of the program were the relational aspects, noting that the non-tangible benefits that they received from the program so, you know, emotional support, sense of belonging, that was the most important thing to them. And that is what the STORIES program is trying to do. As far as meeting basic needs, we did an Amazon wish list for um, the winter holidays, and it was a huge success. So many people donated, um, you know, clothes, boots to these students who were asking for it on their wish list. We also... So I'm there for the program, but then also the other students in the program, they're there to be emotionally supportive to one another. We like to fast track them to resources. They can come to me and say, this is the problem I'm dealing with. Like, who do I go to for this? How can I get help? And I can directly connect them to them. And we're also aspiring to be financially supportive. Um, just this week, actually a couple of days ago, I had to add this to the presentation. The foundation got our donation page up. So it is officially up and running. And so hopefully we can start providing financial support to these students as well. So there's lots of ways to help on campus. Get in touch with me if you have some ideas or anything that you wanna contribute and we can definitely explore those options. How can you support your community? How can you support the foster youth in your own community? Whether that's Ames, Ankeny, Des Moines. Well, I always tell people, you can sign up to be a foster parent. Go to fouroaks.org you can find all the information on how you can sign up. The more foster homes and foster parents we have, it prevents kids from having to leave their schools. For example, the Des Moines district, they do not have foster parents that like to take teens. So all the teens get exported out of Des Moines, such as at my house. And so then when a child from Ames goes into care, I don't have any beds open. And so now that kid from Ames has to go somewhere else. It, it just snowballs, it's a domino effect. There's not enough homes and enough communities. So they're leaving their schools, they're, they're leaving their therapist if they already had one, you know, they're leaving their teachers, all their supports and getting transported into a completely new environment during a very traumatizing time in their life, being separated from parents and siblings. Another thing you can do is advocate. Call your state representative to support extending foster care to 21. We have tried several times now to get this law passed. We have studies that show they do better and they graduate from college at higher rates if foster care and supports are extended to 21. It has never passed before, but we're trying again this year. Um, DHS is in on that, AMP, YSS, all these organizations are pulling together to try to get it passed. So call your local representative and tell them it needs to pass. You can also become a CASA. I was a CASA before I became a foster parent because I wanted to learn more about it. It's a court appointed special advocate. You get assigned to a case and you basically get to be an investigator. You get to talk to all parties in the case. You make a report for the court and you get lots and lots of training 
um, prior to being on the case. So um, you learn about what to do and how it's helpful and what things to look for. So that's another great way that you can advocate and help the foster youth in your community. Okay, so that concludes my presentation. I wanted to leave a little bit of time at the end, so I'm glad I did finish a little bit early. Uh, so if anyone has any questions, any thoughts or ideas that they wanted to share with the group. Hey, Laura, this is Jamil. There are no questions in the chat right now. There's just a ton of comments. Um, thank you for sharing the information. Um, folks are talking about their own situations. Um, somebody mentioned that their kiddo's CASA was a lifesaver. Uh, and as the caseworkers changed that the CASA stayed with them. So that's really great. Um, but folks, if you have questions, feel free to put them on the Zoom chat, preferably, but I am watching both the Whova chat and the Zoom chat so I can get them to voice them out. Yes, Susan, your comment about in Texas, yeah, they, they're doing some crazy stuff down there. They're cons if your children is identifying as transgender, they're saying that that's abuse. Like you must have done something to your kid to make them that way. And right, they are threatening taking transgender kids away from their biological parents and putting them in foster homes. It's insane. And Sarah, yes, the caseworkers change all the time, right? That the turnover of social workers in Iowa is huge. They, their caseloads, they, they have twice the recommended caseload. And so they have all these kids they need to meet with each month and they don't get to them each month. Um, I have a child right now, their worker never came out in February and I'm not even that mad at the worker because I know their job is impossible with all the court hearings they have to go to and everything. So, but yeah, the CASA stays with the case. The caseworkers don't, sometimes the lawyers don't, the guardian ad litems don't, but yeah, the CASA does. So that's really great. I love Brianna's question, um, specific Iowa State things that we can do or change. Yeah, we need to be a more foster friendly campus is what I like to say. Um, the Department of Residents made a change last year because winter break is now longer, the residence halls are now open over winter break. And while foster youth had no impact on why they changed that policy, I'm very happy that they did because that resolves a big problem for a lot of foster youth. You know, the residence halls that were open over break, they tend to be the more expensive ones. And so those aren't the residence halls that foster youth are choosing. They're choosing the cheapest ones available because they know they're not gonna have enough funds to cover it. And so that was one good thing that happened. But yes, we have so many ideas of what we can do better, making them feel more welcome, getting them care packages during prep week. Yeah, so many ideas. Oh, as for Kate asking about sharing the wish list, it did get advertised in a few places. It was in Inside Iowa State. It was very small. It was at the bottom, um, but it was there. We also um, we advertised it in the Human Sciences um, newsletter that goes out to faculty and staff. And I believe some other colleges um, were going to try to get it in their newsletters as well. Um, we will definitely be doing it again next year. It was a huge hit. I also want to do one right before the school year starts in August, like a back to school um, don donation fund because school supplies are expensive. Um, I have a practicum student, Jada Baumhover. She is amazing and she is in talks with companies right now to see if we can get any companies to donate their recycled laptops when they're done with them. Um, for example, she's in talks right now with a company. They recycle their laptops every four years. You know, those laptops still work. There's nothing wrong with them. And so we're trying to get them donated so we can then hand them out to our students. They either don't have a laptop or they can save their money and spend it towards other basic needs because we can provide a laptop for them. So yeah, we have lots of aspirational things that we want to do. Laura, 
quick one for you. As someone just mentioned about sending the wish list to DOR, but also to affinity groups on campus, I may also suggest um, EO, Equal Opportunity, has a newsletter that goes out throughout campus. That's a great Maybe idea. Maybe that's another space to put it in. That's um, a great you, I think idea. there was a question that got missed. Um, Siley uh, asked, uh, how would one become uh, go about becoming a CASA? Yes, yes, okay. So um, the Iowa Child Advocacy Board, that is who owns the CASA program. So I would definitely Google them, get on their website and the contact information is on there. Not every county has CASAs. Um, there was huge budget cuts a few years ago and like half the CASAs got cut, it's terrible. And so I know that there is a need out there and definitely check it out if you're thinking about it. Thank you for that link, Sarah. Ooh, Charles, I like that question. Do caseworkers have a financial motivation to ensure that more kids are placed in foster care? They do not. I mean, you kind of would think that they do after this presentation, right? But no, no, they do not. They just have um, certain, their own biases, for example. Um, there have been certain political pushes in Iowa to keep kids in their homes. That is something that's been happening a lot. I know DHS has been trying very, very hard to keep kids in their homes. Um, it, I wouldn't wanna be in that position where I had to make that determination if a kid stays in their home or they get removed. You know, hindsight's 2020. But yeah, I do know for sure that they are trying their best to keep them in their homes. But yeah, sometimes our implicit biases, they're just, they're too strong. And we might judge a person of color more harshly than we would a white person for doing the exact same kind of parenting or even a criminal offense. Like I said in the presentation, you know, the prison sentences are longer for people of color. Okay. Any other questions, folks? Okay. Well, I would like to thank Laura for this presentation. Very insightful, Laura. Um, the next thing is the keynote speaker um, here at three o'clock. So find it on the agenda and make sure you join over there if you're still with us. Thanks for joining and thank you, Laura. Thanks everyone. Feel free to reach out with me if you have any questions or ideas. Perfect, thank you.